Thank you, Joe, for agreeing to uh, be interviewed by me. But I'd like to start off with asking, so what have you been up to lately? What have I been up to lately? Well, uh, I retired from the Head of Parlors Performance Guild, oh, I guess uh, officially about seven, eight years ago. And uh, what I mainly wanted to do was try to fulfill a promise that I'd already made uh, to myself. Uh, my uh, old mentor and later colleague, uh, Tom Gilbert, and I used to talk about an educational revolution. And uh, somehow we never got about to bring that about. We were so immersed in business, uh, industry, government, and the military. So upon retiring, the first thing that I did was try to revisit the literature and uh, look at what has been written about educational reform and revisited my past, which is uh, learning theory and so forth. Spent the better part of about two years uh, doing that. I manifest that, uh, that research uh, into a book called The Eden Conspiracy, colon, Educating for Accomplished uh, Citizenship, which is a speculation uh, about a relatively a new approach uh, to, to education, uh, which obviously is accomplishment uh, based from the title. Uh, that book got some notice. Uh, it got notice from three sources. Uh, notice number one, uh, my home organization, the International Society for Performance and Improvement, uh, selected that book as the outstanding publication for whatever year it was, uh, uh, 2000 I believe, believe it was. Uh, uh, notice uh, number, number two uh, came from our own superintendent of education in our uh, county in Georgia, uh, who was also very much interested in improving education uh, in, in our county. Not only is that his job, but he was being beaten around the head and shoulders by our employers about the kind of product that we were getting out of our educational system. Our uh, state of Georgia is always ranked last and next to last in virtually uh, any measure of education and have a severe dropout problem and it was pretty severe in our area too. So I worked with the superintendent of education to set up a group where we would analyze, design, and develop, develop uh, uh, some improvements based on the Eden Conspiracy. Uh, this was a group of leaders in, in our county and one of the things that came out of that was a, a charter school, which is probably the first accomplishment-based or performance-based school uh, in the nation. And that's going uh, great guns now. And uh, it uh, was uh, then getting some uh, statewide attention and now national uh, attention. The third person who paid attention to that book was the governor of Georgia who ran on the platform of educational reform uh, in Georgia and the book came to his attention as well as uh, our efforts with, uh, with uh, trying to start the charter school. Uh, visiting with the governor after he read the book, uh, we walked away with $7 million for our county and was able to fund the school for that. Interesting to note, uh, the governor was then defeated in his next uh, term largely by a coalition uh, and uh, uh, attempt by school teachers who took uh, great umbrage at that. So, so, so it goes. See, what was a, it was a great answer. I don't remember the question. The question was what I've been doing. Well, the other thing <clears throat> we've been doing is, uh, is uh, I was very much interested in seeing uh, the extent of performance technology, uh, especially in the diagnostic model. As, as part of front-end analysis. And I uh, had the opportunity under the, uh, under the aegis of the Chamber of Commerce to do a citywide, countywide front-end analysis on community improvement as a whole. Uh, we assembled a group of about uh, 100 uh, people, uh, laypersons in our county, laypersons to our profession, and I taught them diagnostic front-end analysis, if you can imagine uh, that. And we spent about a year doing a diagnostic front-end analysis on uh, the problems and needs of, of our county and produced a massive number of recommendations that ultimately involved 5,000 people uh, involved in this uh, uh, 
analysis and uh, scores and scores of, of community improvement projects the need for was uh, based on that all the way from such relatively small things as uh, uh, rerouting some traffic, uh, changing some streets from uh, two-way to one-way, all the way up to the need for, and now has been funded, a $40 million new hospital, everything in between. So uh, I've been trying to work then uh, uh, on societal improvement or at least extending the scope of performance technology. And uh, although my uh, colleagues in, in, in the old field will jump off a bridge hearing me say it, we did all this pro bono. Uh, <laughs> also, I know that will come as a shock to some of my, some of my uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, what else? The uh, question was what I've been doing. Um, I, I wonder, does the, uh, the people in our profession know what uh, B.F. Skinner's original uh, career goals were? You, do, you, do you know offhand? No, I, I don't. Tell me. Uh, Dr. Skinner set out to be a novelist. He wanted to be a novelist. As a matter of fact, Dr. Skinner's undergraduate degree is in English, not in psychology. And I've had old colleagues to say, oh, you guys are just workbook writers and what you really want to be is a novelist. I watch my good friend Bob Mager write a novel. I says, hey, I bet I could do that too. So I wrote a novel, uh, which is a historical novel called, uh, what's it called? The uh, Black Warrior's Curse. And it was, it was published. Uh, I think it sold uh, seven copies, uh, five of, of whom to my mother. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it came recently, by the way, and I can announce for the first time, uh, to the attention of a Hollywood producer who has acquired, acquired the rights to uh, Black Warrior's Curse, and hopefully we'll, uh, uh, we'll have, a, uh, have a movie to come out of that. However, did I get a lesson? Uh, getting a book published is about like getting hit by lightning, but getting a book uh, into a movie is about like getting hyped get hit by lightning thrice. So it may never, uh, never happen. Tell so us about the storyline. Tell us about the storyline about Black Warriors. The storyline of Black Warriors Curse. I grew up in um, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And when I was in high school was the, really the start of the dawn of the civil rights uh, movement. This is pre-Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and so forth. And uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama is the home of the University of Alabama. And the University of Alabama uh, was going to be the first in the Southeastern Conference to be integrated. It was targeted. And uh, we had a, a, a black student accepted for the first time uh, there, which created riots and so forth. Uh, the novel depicts my role in that. I happen to be an innocent, quote, innocent bystander that caught up into it. Into it. So it, it chronicles then, as that is the first instance, to many things that happened, and, and like uh, Forrest Gump, I happened to be uh, on the sidelines and involved in many things in the black, right, black uh, in the, uh, in the uh, civil rights movement, and the Black Warriors Curse uh, then chronicles that. It's a thinly veiled uh, biography, uh, if you will. Uh, the Selma March, Black Sunday, uh, the March on Washington, and uh, uh, the, the, the bombings of the buses, uh, and so forth, and uh, and much of it is authentic. Of course, the names have been changed to protect the uh, the guilty, if you will. But some of those people are still alive. Tell me a little bit about your collegiate football career. And <laughs> my collegiate football career. Let me talk to you about my uh, junior high career, which was much. You <laughs> think my my collegiate football career? My collegiate football career was. Uh, Oh, I would imagine 28 minutes uh, long. Uh, if you are any kid of any talent or any size in the state of Alabama, of course your ambition is to go to the university, the University of Alabama, and play, play football. I guess I was a pretty fair uh, high school uh, football player and, of course, had designs then to go to uh, the University of Alabama. <clears throat> I, I was hurt quite a bit badly broken ankles and this and that and the other, uh, and so did not play uh, too much later in high school, but uh, I was not recruited uh, any place in the Southeastern Conference. So I uh, went to the University of Alabama uh, on a pre-med scholarship, of, of all things, and uh, decided to walk on at, uh, at the University of Alabama, and when we showed up, 
there, uh, it was just full of all-state and all-American freshmen, and so they they timed us and weighed us and ran us through some things and and they cut folks the first day and I was able to come back the second day and you know and so forth. I thought that I was a uh, be, would be able to catch on as a kicker because I was a pretty good high school uh, kicker, both punting and, and, and field goals, until uh, uh, in practice, a uh, coach, one of the assistant coaches came over and said, hey, meathead, or some something at mm -hmm. me, Harris, get your butt up to see the coach. I said, what coach? He says, the coach, you meathead. So do you know who the coach was? Bear Bryant. Bear Bryant. It's also his first year there. So I went up to uh, Coach Bryant's office, and uh, Coach Bryant had my records there. Can you believe that, that he would even have the records of a walk-on, small, slow uh, player, you know? And he says, Harris, I think, see, you're a pretty good student. You're never going to make this football team, but I want you to sign on as a tutor, which I did. And so then for my collegiate football career, at Alabama was largely, uh, other than the freshman team, was uh, as, as a tutor. Uh, I didn't, and the question always comes, did you tutor Joe Namath? Uh, no, I did not tutor uh, Joe Namath, uh, who turned out to be a pretty good student, and by the way, has just gotten his degree last year, finally, at the University of Alabama after 40 years later. So that was my, my uh, collegiate uh, career, most largely as a tutor. Another colleague of mine that, that uh, maybe the audience knows, a past president of ISPI, Claude Lineberry, uh, also uh, walked on. And uh, uh, Lineberry was a uh, uh, all-state soccer player, had not played football, and he was cut the first day. So, <laughs> so I never let, all the years later, I never let Claude forget that I uh, lasted longer on the team than he did. Uh, can we segue into uh, you telling us some of your favorite memories and stories of, of people like Claude? I know that he was a fraternity brother yeah. of yours, correct? Yeah, that's right. Golly. Where, I don't know. Uh, is this going to the airways? Do we have to censor this? I, I, I can do that if yeah, it's needed. I, I think maybe I can, I can keep it uh, uh, less raucous than it, than it might be. Speaking of that, yes, in fact, uh, Lineberry and I were fraternity brothers, of which the brothers, uh, we pledged the same fraternity, of which the brothers learned to uh, regret. I can assure you that both of us. But I first met Claude at the first fraternity party we had. We were both, uh, both pledges. And uh, I was really making time with one of the other guests, uh, a young lady who later then finished, I think, third in the Miss Alabama contest. Nice. Because of her talent, of course. Mm -hmm. I think her talent was baton twirly. <laughs> well, in any event, I was making pretty good time until old Butch Lineberry, this kid I didn't know, showed up and kind of uh, told her, if I think, and says, you probably want to spend time with this sweaty animal. I've seen him naked and he's not a pretty sight. And he left with Miss Alabama and left me alone <laughs> for that. And so you would think we'd become lifelong enemies after that, but we became uh, lifelong friends. And uh, we graduated uh, uh, together. Uh, I uh, went then, and I was a psych major, and Butch, I think, was an English, I think he was an English major. And he was uh, uh, a little bit older and was drafted right out of college, went on to the Army, and I went and joined Tom Gilbert uh, in, uh, in a consulting firm in uh, in New York, in, in program instruction firm in New York, but uh, but I'll never forget that story of, of, of a Butch uh, uh, then. Uh, later, when Butch came out of the army, I recruited him for the then the Harvest Performance Guild, and he became a partner then in in the firm, and uh, we had had a great time uh, there. We even did some good work. Uh, who knows? So we built up the firm, and Butch really helped uh, build the firm up. And uh, it, was, it was wonderful. We were traveling in, in those days a great deal. And in those days, airlines would give you little bottles, little miniature bottles of, of booze, you know. And so uh, Claude was not much of a drinker, and neither was I. But he, we'd save our little bottles of booze. And then every year at the annual Christmas party, Harley's Performance Guild Christmas party, 
uh, line bearer would get a big punch bowl, and without even looking to the label, would dump every all the bottles into that uh, uh, to it and, and cut it with something. Lineberry, one year at our Christmas party, decided that uh, what would a Christmas party be without a Santa Claus? So he went across the street from our office building to uh, to a shopping uh, center and uh, uh, found the, a department store Santa Claus on his lunch break, got him back over there, fed old Santa a whole bunch of this concoction, and Santa never made it back. <laughs> And I believe the poor guy got him fired. So Langer almost got me fired a number of times for client, but I'm sure that he really got Santa, Santa fired. But I don't, I don't want to say that it was all fun and games with Claude because he was a, a magnificent uh, analyst. And uh, uh, incidentally, uh, I, uh, I hope that the audience uh, might have a chance to see some tapes of, of him because he was extremely witty, the, the funniest human being I've ever, I've ever met. And he could uh, uh, he could have made his living as a stand-up comic uh, or, or a talk show host or, or whatever. And he was very very uh, uh, quick on that. But I have got a million uh, library uh, stories mm -hmm. about that. Anybody else? <laughs> How about uh, Tom Gilbert and Marilyn Gilbert? Oh yeah, Tom. Well, it's not a well-known uh, fact, and maybe nobody cares. But I'm in the field uh, because of an era that uh, I made. I was an undergraduate, uh, uh, I was going to be a biology major, and I had a pre-med scholarship. I was a pretty good, pretty good student. And uh, I think as a sophomore, uh, first day of, of, of semester, I got into the wrong class and by mistake, you know, a typical, typical mistake. And in it was this guy, it looked like a fox was lecturing. And I became absolutely enthralled with it. It turned out to be a psychology class. And I was not only then that I stay and hear the rest of the lecture, but I went and then signed up for that course and then a year later changed my major to psychology. And that professor was Tom Gilbert. And then uh, I, uh, Tom then left the University of Alabama. He had been down from Harvard from, uh, from the teaching machine project at, uh, at B.F. Skinner. Uh, B. F. Skinner and established uh, uh, probably the first experimental lab outside of Harvard. I believe it was at the University of Alabama. So we had a, uh, a real good foundation in those days. Uh, when I graduated uh, then, uh, I joined Tom at the first uh, company in the nation devoted to developing program instruction. Well, maybe not the first, but one of the early ones called Tour Education in New York uh, for that. And so that was quite a, a uh, interesting number of years working for Tom. You nobody ever worked with Tom. You worked for Tom. And uh, I think uh, uh, Tom is, is certainly one of, if not the brightest person that I've ever known. I, I watched, uh, watched him. Things that it would take me weeks, sometimes months to figure out, uh, Tom would uh, come to the same conclusion uh, independently on his way to the water fountain. He was just that that quick. And like a lot of geniuses, uh, they can't describe uh, what, what, what method that, uh, that they were using uh, uh, for it. Uh, one of a, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm just looking to see if my, my telephone is ringing. <laughs> yeah, no. uh, the uh, other time, Tom, Tom also had no personal censors uh, either. We were doing a project uh, for the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, which later you know, went on to become a premier instructional technology uh, organization. And the Centers for Disease Control, called Communicable Disease Center in those days, was a, an, uh, an installation that was under the Public Health Service, which was under the Commission Corps of the Navy, of all things. And the head of it was an admiral. And the admiral was not only a physician, but an admiral and a real spit and polish uh, uh, guy. Uh, Tom did not uh, did not suffer fools or egos very well. So Tom had a, uh, a habit of uh, that in the mid afternoon he had to take naps. So the only place that he could find to take a nap was the admiral's conference table. And the admiral caught him one day sleeping under on his conference table. 
And I was there, and I can swear to this. He walked over and he shook and said, Hey, 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 who are you? What do you do here? And Tom raised up and said, Infinitely more than you do. <laughs> lay, back, lay back down. <laughs> so, I don't know, Tom Gilbert stories. Golly, years and years later, uh, when I was uh, at Harless Performance Guild, uh, I got Tom to come in as a consultant on a project. And then he rented a, a town car, of which we had budget uh, for a Ford or something, and drove it off into a lake and was able to, conjole, uh, to uh, con some young lady who came by to swim out and get his briefcase and come back uh, uh, to it. And so I kept waiting for a massive lawsuit to happen, but it, it did not. I, I could go on and on. One of the stories that I remember from years and years ago that I heard you tell is Tom bet, uh, uh, challenging you uh, in terms of how much money you needed to make here. And he, I don't know if it was a bet that the two of you had. Remember that? Uh, remember Where he wanted you to make a million dollars and you went back and said you made a million dollars. He said after tax. Oh, that <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that's probably, uh, probably, probably. I'll never forget it. One of the things that we said is that uh, there was a guy in our field that uh, wrote a book called Million Dollar Consultant. And uh, we were at the same conference uh, together, uh, this man, Tom, and I, and we were sitting on the same panel. And the guy asked him, says, uh, uh, it says Dr. Gilbert, have you read my book, Million Dollar Consultant? And he says, no, uh, I read Dr. Harless's book, which is $2 million consulting. Maybe that was, maybe that was it. <laughs> Do you have any uh, favorite stories about Bill Detterline? Oh, Bill Detterline. <clears throat> Bill uh, uh, also was a real character in the business. Very, very bright, very good. A uh, real master of program instruction, uh, by the way. And uh, uh, Bill and I uh, were uh, great, uh, great competitors, uh, if you will. Not only professionally, but uh, in other kinds of ways. But I loved him, loved him dearly. And... Uh, uh, golly, what can I say? You know, these always, the stories I have is how I almost got arrested because of these people. I remember driving with Bill Dutterline somewhere in Washington, and the police pulled us over. And I had been speeding or hit like, or was out or something. But he came up and asked for my license and so forth. And Dutterline popped up and says, uh, Harless uh, says, Officer, you don't have to worry about this man. I've seen him driving drunk, drunker than this many times. <laughs> and the cop pulled over. <laughs> so I almost got arrested uh, for it. And Denderline never, ever tried to make amends for that <laughs> at all. Bill Denderline. Yeah. <laughs> Any stories about uh, Gary Rumler? Gary, ah, Gary Rumler. Uh, Gary, uh, Gary and I used to go around trying to sell performance technology together, even though we were, uh, our firm and his firm were, were great, uh, great competitors, we always wound up, uh, uh, you know, doing that. And we had a little act that he would be, uh, Johnny Carson and I would be, uh, who's the insult? Epic Man. No, no, oh. no, the insult comic. Uh, uh, oh, Don Rickles. Don Rickles, and we would, we would play that uh, often. And we had our lines up and together, and we did that uh, quite a bit. Uh, uh, good. Uh, Harness Performance Guild was in Washington, D.C., and we were there in the heyday of Great Society with Johnson and so forth. And President Johnson and the Great Society were throwing money out the window. It, it, it just really unbelievable. We're talking about the expenditure now. You should have seen it then. And a lot of that was on, you know, societal improvement and things of that sort. And so our house became the informal consulting Lodge, lodging for consultants uh, who would come into town and uh, Carol and I would uh, give them a food and, and a place to sleep and so forth because, you know, those days nobody had, they didn't have any money. You know, they were performance consultants, you know, whatever. And so uh, my game was uh, table tennis ball and Gary Rohn was a big table tennis player. And Gary and I were competitive, I mean, in everything. So we had some wars in table tennis. So first time he came, uh, I was able to, uh, Gary was not much of a drinker, so I would mix him doubles and triples. 
and then wipe him up. And <laughs> play well, I wouldn't have any. And then Gary caught on to this. The next time he came, he refused anything and then wiped me up uh, for it. So we were friendly competitors uh, and everything uh, long. And, and uh, I think on your website, you talk about we've lost a giant. I think professionally and uh, personally, Gary Rummer was, was, a, was a giant. He really is. Second greatest mind I've ever known. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Recently, a, another one of our luminaries passed away, Susan Markle. Do you have any favorite stories of her? Oh, I don't know. Susan Markle, of course, is, a, is another giant who, who has passed in early. Uh, Susan uh, was one of the original Skinner Fellows with Gilbert and others uh, in the old Teaching Machine Project. She had a great deal of influence on me uh, back in the days when we were enamored with developing program instruction. Her book, uh, uh, Good Frames and Bad, was, was really a classic uh, for it. Uh, Susan was also, I think, the uh, third, I believe, third president of ISPI, and uh, she didn't know I was existing. I was a, just a whippersnapper, 10 years old, actually, at the time. But uh, Susan never paid a lot of attention to me uh, until she found out <clears throat> that I lived next door in New York City to Thelonious Monk the jazz great, and it turns out that Susan is one of the world's experts in, in jazz. As a matter of fact, she spent the last 20 years of her life in, in that arena rather than in our arena. So I then became all right with, uh, with uh, Susan uh, uh, because of uh, Thelonious Monk. Uh, then later, as we grew in stature and size and so forth, <coughs> uh, Susan, uh, Susan and her husband, Phil Tima, at the time, uh, I had hired as consultants to some of our, our projects. I mostly uh, wanted not for her acumen, but because she taught me how to make the best martini that you ever existed. And she could flat make a martini. And they had this great apartment in Chicago in, uh, what do you call those towers? Marina Towers. Marina Towers. <clears throat> and so every time I'd go to Chicago, <clears throat> allegedly, to work on projects, we'd go to their house for supper. And uh, the Marina Towers were... Their, theirs was like on the 50-something floor, it was above the clouds. And so I can always remember Susan and I standing there with her great martinis and drinking and looking. And she also was a plotter for the uh, uh, educational uh, uh, revolution. And um, uh, I, 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 I wish the, the current uh, group of folks would know more about Susan. Uh, even though she left uh, early, she really let, left a mark on, on a lot of us. Are there any other favorite people from, from the past in the society that uh, you could share a story with? Well, us? I don't know about the society, but the feel. Let's see. Well, I had said early, uh, who is the father of us all is B.F. Skinner. And uh, I didn't, did not uh, go uh, to Harvard either as an undergraduate or a doctoral uh, level. Um, and, uh, but my first conference, ISPR, and then NSPI conference was uh, Philadelphia which was the third, I think, conference. And I had just graduated from uh, college at eight years old at the time. And for some reason, oh, I remember what it was, in order to have my way paid there, they said that you had to be on the program. So I submitted a paper. And lo and behold, uh, as a 22-year-old, my paper was accepted. I couldn't, couldn't believe it uh, to that. And so I was quite frightened at that. In those days, the society was quite small. I would imagine there probably was six, seven hundred members in the whole thing. And the conference, you know, would have five or six, four, five, six hundred people. And they had only two tracks at the time. And so you, you pick between two sessions rather than 28 or whatever it is uh, uh, now. And so my paper was scheduled. Uh, and as it turned out, the other speaker for the rival session did not show. And so I was the only one at that time slot on the program. And so the whole the society came to this whippersnappers thing. Much quivering of voices, getting slides upside down, knocking of knees, terrified at the, at the audience, and even more terrified when I looked up and saw in the front row was Susan Mark, Bill Dutterline, Gary Rumler, I think Don Toasty, and B.F. Skinner. Somehow I did not faint. Somehow I got through it. 
at the end of it, Dr. Skinner came up to me and was most complimentary about it and invited me to lunch with he and the other, other folks. Now, that is just something else. You cannot imagine, you know, what an impact that had on me. I had very little obvious to say, but sitting there, those, those people seemed like they were nine feet tall, you know. Well, I'll, I'll never forget that. Years and years later, <clears throat> then uh, I was able to work at Harvard at, uh, adjunct, uh, on the adjunct faculty for, for a project that was under Skinner's leadership, and he tapped me uh, for that. And he remembered, uh, remembered uh, that, that uh, session, and I was eternally grateful for him. Very interesting man, Dr. Skinner was. His, his private persona uh, was fairly different from his public persona. Uh, he, 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 was, he was quite quiet. Uh, he was not radical at all. And he used forbidden words like brainstorming. And I could not imagine Dr. Skinner in brainstorming. Uh, I, I chuckle now when I go around and hear that uh, Skinnerian psychology has been disproved. Well, that's absurd and crap. You know, it's still, still our, our fundamentals. Uh, if we, but if you start tracing back the luminaries you've gone through and the and even now, many of them, of course, still have the roots uh, in, uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Skinner. Yeah. I think, as a matter of fact, Carl Binder, uh, one of our current luminaries, was his last uh, head of, head of, his, of his last lab. That's uh, the last head of the lab uh, for it. Of course, Susan and, uh, and, uh, and Tom and all others were all members of that uh, postdoc uh, group that he had. But I always have a warm spot in my heart for, for Dr. Skinner. For and now also, I think it might be some of the motives why I tried to write a novel, because Dr. Skinner I did. He was so much brighter than me, but I'm a better novelist. <laughs> I guess. Well, Joe, thank you for your time this oh, afternoon, and um, <clears throat> may I invite myself back next year to do this again? Absolutely. We certainly did, if, if I'm still vertical, and uh, which I may or may not be the way, way things are going, because I'm now, now 39. <laughs> so who knows? Thank you.